Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Decode Chess channel. I am International Master Camilla Ciovano and in this video I would like to show you the third game played at the current World Chess Championships between Magnus Carlsen and Janne Pomniacki. So in the third game um, they played exactly the same opening as in the first game. They played a Rui Lopez, Jan having the white pieces and Magnus having the black pieces. Uh, it's just that at move number eight Jan uh, made a new move okay and we will see what it is about and uh, what I would like to show you first of all is the fact that According to Stockfish, nobody made any error, so there are no inaccuracies, mistakes or blunders. So basically, uh, they played <laughs> correctly and for most of the game, uh, the position was equal and so in the end they ended with a draw. So they played uh, the anti-martial uh, variation and you can find it in the opening encyclopedia as C88. And now let's go and see the game. e4, e5, knight f3, knight to c6, bishop to b5, a6, and the bishop retreats to a4, knight f6, castle, bishop to e7, and now rook to e1, finally b5, bishop to b3, castle. And now we are at move number 8 when white plays a4. In the previous game, so in the first round, Jan played pawn to h3, followed by knight a5, and uh, Magnus sacrificed the central pawn for the initiative, uh, remaining with a pair of bishops, and white having some problems with the development on the queen side. Okay, Anyways, uh, after a4, Magnus plays bishop to b7. I just saw one of his games as he was playing as white against the Levon Aronian in 2013 at the Sinkfield Cup. And, um, and here uh, Aronian responded with pawn to b4. But Magnus plays bishop b7. Okay, so let's go on. Pawn to d3. Okay, they just have to complete their development. And uh, white would like to bring the knight from the queen side on black's weak square on f5. So that's why he's making a maneuver. He develops the knight on d2 in order to go to f1, then to e3, and finally to f5. Obviously, from e3, it also controls the central square d5. So let's go on. Knight f1, pawn to h6. Okay, so black is taking control of the g5 square, not allowing white to bring any piece on it, and white simply continues developing. And black is reorganizing a little bit. Probably he wants to bring the knight to e7 and uh, make space to advance with the pawns, and from e7 the knight is also uh, defending well both f5 and d5. Probably at some point black would also like to push d5, so knight e3, knight to e7, and finally now white will uh, try to open the c file and so expose the weak pawn on c7. So let's see, they make a trade, knight takes back, knight to c6, white brings the rook on the semi-open file, and uh, white has um, a nice position, uh, enough space for developing and improving the position of his pieces. Black is returning with a knight uh, on c6, even uh, protecting a5 and looking toward d4. Good, so pawn to a5. Now white will bring the bishop on the long diagonal. Can you see that both bishops are oriented toward black's king? And of course, uh, also in the center. And now uh, black would probably like to bring the other bishop on g4, trade the knight on f3, and so have more control of the d4 square. So white basically what he does right now, he's breaking the center, trying to mobilize uh, much better his pieces, and maybe to gain uh, not only more space, but also a better initiative. So black takes, they just trade 
knight and at this point white uh, creates a battery with a queen and bishop we can see that looks toward g7 which for now is well protected and uh black has a weak pawn on a5 which is being attacked twice and now instead of defending the pawn black is developing the bishop on e6 so uh, at this point white plays pawn to h3 which uh, is not the suggestion of stockfish because he suggests at this point to play queen to d3 let's see in this case uh, let's see why, why queen to d3 is important all right because black is threatening one of the major threats of black is to push the pawn to d5 okay and uh, break the center and uh, what white does by bringing the queen to d3 is opening the bishop so that if black pushes the pawn to d5 white will take the knight on f6 and uh, black will probably lose the pawn so we see it right here queen to d3 is beneficial because it threatens to play bishop takes f6 by making way through d4 so white has simply opened the diagonal of the bishop in order to be able to attack the knight that is defending the d5 square so let's have a look at this variation for example if black plays pawn to c6 and now white retreats the bishop to c2 can you see that he would like to push the pawn to e5 at some point or even um, take the knight on f6 and then by opening the diagonal white would be threatening a checkmate on h7 so now black cannot play pawn to d5 why because in this case white will take on f6 first so captures the knight and let's see also the continuation so queen d3 c6 now bishop on c2 and d5 is a blunder because of bishop takes to f6 and black cannot play queen to f6 why not because white will take on d5 and attack the bishop and then also threaten the checkmate on h7 so basically black is going to lose the bishop if he plays bishop f5 white simply takes it and so white is one piece up this is very important so uh, queen d3 is beneficial because enables bishop takes f6 just in case black will push c6 and uh, d5 another important thing is uh, to see what are the alternatives and um, why queen d3 is better than the alternative so let's go back uh, before pawn to h3 move 21 and let's see so why not taking the weak pawn on a5 which is not defended so we have the variation over here queen d3 is better than the alternatives if knight takes a5 then c5 would follow attacking the queen the queen needs to go down to d2 to defend the knight twice and finally bishop takes b3 at this point if white takes back with a knight could lose the pawn on e4 or the pawn on a4 they're both being under attack and if white pushes the pawn to e5 black will take back knight takes back and so black has a good position and before going forward to see how the game was played i would like to show you also uh, the new feature of the application in which um, they are explaining the move played in the position which was an inaccuracy and they're explaining why the move was an inaccuracy for example uh, move 21 pawn to h3 misses the winning material and so white has no advantage all right so we are at move number 23 and let's see how they played pawn to h3 pawn to c6 and bishop to c2 we see that white has uh, the same idea and now black finally pushes the pawn to d5 and now it is possible to do so because um, white will not be able to eliminate one of the defenders which is the knight on f6 and we saw what the application suggested 
So now black uh, will change the character of the position by trading some pawns in the center. So what is white supposed to do uh, in this moment? The best move, even suggested by the engine, is the pawn to e5. So my question in this position would be, why is best for white to push the pawn to e5 and not to simply to move away the knight that is being attacked? So we will see right in the engine's explanations that e5 is better than the alternatives. For example, if white would move the knight to b6, it is a logical move, just move forward and attack the rook. Well, in this case, black will push the pawn to c5 and can you see that it interrupts the communication between white's queen and the knight and so the knight remains under attack. And when white moves the queen back, now queen takes b6, bishop takes f6 and black has an intermediate move, pawn to c4 attacking the queen. The queen goes to pin the pawn on g7 so it cannot take back the bishop. And finally, now black has a much better position, strategically speaking, because of the two pawns that have invaded white's territory. And we will see the whole line. So now black is attacking the bishop that has to move away. And black is sending it backwards still. And so finally black gains a pawn. And having the two passed pawns uh, on the fourth rank uh, assures black's victory. All right, so let's go back to uh, the game. White played pawn to e5, even as uh, the engine suggests, and black took the knight on c4. Okay, queen takes to d8, rook takes d8, they traded queens and some minor pieces. And finally, we have a rook's end game uh, with a bishop and some pawns. And uh, white will try to simplify the position. Black's pawn structure is weaker because of the double pawns on the C file, but that is not sufficient uh, for white to win the end game. Let's see how they continued. Black centralizes the king and white is bringing the king up as well. It's just that black does not have uh, too many weaknesses and so white cannot even infiltrate with the king in black's camp can you see that the pawns will um, forbid the king from going forward and finally uh, black activates his own bishop by attacking the weak pawn on a4 and so that white's bishop has to remain passive on c2 defending it and finally uh, white will also prevent black from infiltrating into his camp and they will agree for a draw by the repetition, so in only 41 moves. So, ladies and gentlemen, to summarize a little bit our intervention today, we can say that uh, we have analyzed a few key positions in the game in which we saw that uh, by some pawn trades, the whole character of the position changed. We saw, for example, at move 21, that instead of moving the pawn to h3, as Jan did in the game, there was a very good idea to instead move the queen to d3, opening up the bishop. Then we saw what would have happened in case white would have taken the pawn on a5 and the lines that uh, the engine suggested. And then probably the most important decision in the game at move number uh, 23, when white pushed the pawn to e5. And so after a few trades, uh, maintaining an equal position that resulted in a final draw. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for your attention and I cannot wait to talk to you in the next video. This is International Master Camila Ciobanu again, wishing you a wonderful day.